If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I encourage you to open them to Deuteronomy chapter 31, which will be our text for this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there are some available back at the sound booth. Feel free to grab one of those or pull it up on your phone, uh, but get some copy of God's Word in front of you. Our text will be from Deuteronomy chapter 31. And as you're flipping over there, I want to ask you all a question to consider as we begin our sermon this morning, and that is, should we fill our corporate worship services with God's blessings, or should we remove God's blessings from the corporate worship service? This maybe sounds like a silly hypothetical question to ask, but I want to ask it again and really consider, should we fill our corporate worship services with God's blessings, or should we remove God's blessings from our corporate worship services. Well, as we are continuing through this five-week series, through what we've put forward as our church particulars, we come to our third church particular this morning, and that is family-style worship. Family-style worship. The first two weeks in this series, we looked at a first, which was commitment to the Bible's sufficiency as week one, and the second was expository Christ-centered preaching, and this morning we get to family style worship. And then the following two weeks, Lord willing, we will cover intentional hospitality and community and mission-minded outreach. But this morning, we come to this topic of family-style worship. And really, as we begin, I want, want us to truly consider the value of children and the war against children. The reality is in evangelicalism today, we're having an incredible mortality rate when it comes to the children of the church, the children that have been raised up in the church, walking away from the church. In fact, our children would have greater success of living going on to the beaches of Normandy than they would growing up and continuing to attend church as an adult. The, the rate of children that are growing up in the church and then leaving the church is a shockingly high rate. And as we do this, we, we must consider as a church, how do we consider children in the life of our church? How do we consider children within the body here at First Southern Baptist Church? How do we value them? How do we pour into them? How do we give them the gospel? And how do we do so in such a way that's consistent with the first two particulars that we already laid out, that we're committed to the sufficiency of Scripture, that we believe in the value of expository Christ-centered preaching? And what value does this have to our children as we gather together on the Lord's Day? Our text this morning will be in Deuteronomy chapter 31, and the context of Deuteronomy is, is quite a powerful book. It's one of those books that I think it gets missed by so many Christians, and they don't see the wealth of the beauty of the book of Deuteronomy. It's the close of the first five books of the Bible, and what it details is after Moses has done this incredible work of freeing the people from their captivity in Egypt, they walk through the Red Sea, and they're given God's law at Mount Sinai, but then because of their disobedience, they have to wander in the desert for 40 years, and the book of Deuteronomy is written to remind them of that word that they heard on Mount Sinai and prepare them before Joshua leads them through the Jordan into the promised land. It's to remind them of God's word before they cross into the promises of God. And thus, from that point, we, we arrive in Deuteronomy chapter 31. And our text will be verses 12 through 13, but for this first reading, I'm going to start in verse 9 to give a little context to those two verses. Listen to God's word from Deuteronomy 31. It says, Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priest, the son of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them at the end of seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Now, if you remember from us studying Nehemiah, they were doing this very festival in accordance to this thing at the Feast of Booths. 
but goes on to say in verses 12 through 13, and these are our verses for this morning, assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's go before him in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we get to gather before you in worship this morning. Lord, I'm thankful for each and every one of the saints that is gathered here today. And Lord, my heart is lifted up by our time of singing praise to you and offering prayers together with one another. And Lord, as we gather with one another to study this text this morning and consider what your word has to say about children in the life of the local church, particularly as it pertains to our corporate worship, Lord, I pray that you would grow our love for what your word teaches on this matter. And Lord, as the opening question was asked, Lord, I pray that we would be a church that welcomes with arms wide open the blessings that you would seek to provide to us as a church. That we wouldn't neglect your blessing. That we wouldn't speak out of both sides of our mouth and be inconsistent in what we say about our children or what we think about our children. But Lord, would we love the children of this church? Would we seek to pass on the faith to them? Lord, would you give us patience in these things? Would you give us understanding in these things? Lord, would you govern our hearts in these things? God, would you glorify your church as the family and the household of God? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we work through this time, I feel like there is hours and hours of content that I would like to spend on this um, that I will not be able to. And so with this, just know that many of the, the texts that we're going over, we're just going to touch on briefly. But I hope that as we work through this, you'll see the overwhelming weight of God's word and what it has to say on this matter. And my prayer is that our affections will be stirred for the truths contained within this. And all of this pertains to the value of having families together on the Lord's Day as we gather for worship. But in order to understand that, I want us to go upstream a little bit in this first point and to consider the church as a family of families. The church as a family of families. Now to begin, I want to just emphasize that I believe that one of the greatest sins in our culture today is the idolatry of individualism. We view ourselves almost entirely as an individual unit. We don't tend to think of ourselves in corporate terms. We tend to think of me, myself, and I, and even though we're part of other associations, we are constantly running through what is best for me, what works best for me, what do I want, what is important to me. And now, in saying this, I'm not discounting the fact that we are all individuals. God made each and every one of us. He knit us particularly in our mother's womb. Each of us individually has value and purpose, and the Lord knows the hairs on every single one of our heads, right? We are all an individual that matters before God, but we are not to engage in individualism. In other words, the, the overarching worldview that views everything through the lens of self and self-identity and whatever we want to be. But rather, we are to think of ourselves that God created us as individuals, but then put us into communities. And that first community they places us in is that of a, a family. And God works his gospel through families, and he's been doing so since the very beginning. Going back to the Garden of Eden, what was the hope of the gospel that was proclaimed as the curses were being given? That through the offspring of woman, through her child, through her descendant, one who would come to crush the power of sin and Satan. And then we see through the successive covenants that go through the Old Testament that all of them have an incredible emphasis on how God is going to work through the family. This is true of Noah as he saves this righteous man as well as his family. And then his offspring is given the command to then go, therefore, 
and reestablish the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth to take dominion over it. We see that God's promise to Abraham that through his son, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. We see that that forms then into the nation of Israel. It's through his offspring, his family. We see in the Davidic covenant that he promises that one of David's sons, the king of Israel, would reign on his throne eternally. It's one of his offspring. And then what does the New Testament begin with? If you were open to Matthew chapter 1, it begins with what? A lineage, a family tree of the Lord Jesus Christ, connecting him not just in an arbitrary way back through the ages, but back to those covenant familial promises that God had made in the successive generations. And all of this leads to the person and work of Christ and what he is doing. The Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. He lived the perfect life. He died the substitutionary death and he rose gloriously from the dead that all who believe in him might not only be saved from their sins, but what? Adopted into his household. And thus, as the people of God who have been redeemed by God, we become the children of God and the family of God. We see this wonderful aspect of adoption playing out in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. There's a whole lot to unpack here, but I want us to just emphasize how the work of the gospel is most incredibly realized within us through the work of adoption. Listen to what it says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Do you see that the glory of the work of the gospel is that he adopts us into his family. And as we've looked at in the previous weeks, that as we gather as the church, we are members of the household of God. That's family language. We are members of the family of God. But many will say, oh, but so much of that family type language, that's just Old Testament. And that was just to maintain some sort of family line to lead us to Jesus. But the writers of the New Testament didn't suddenly seem to abandon the significance of the family as it pertains to God's gospel going forward. In fact, the very beginning of the church, one of the first sermons ever preached after Christ resurrected and was seated at the right hand of the Father, listen to what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 39. Now when they had heard this, and that is a gospel proclamation, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But goes on to say in the next sentence, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And we see that as this gospel is going forth, as God is building his church, one of the primary means, I would say the primary means he's doing that, is through the children of believers that are being raised up in the Lord. And that is, statistics bear that out. It's something like 70% of people that are baptized um, in Baptist churches are done as children. And that's not surprising. That's not shocking. It's because they've been entrusted with the oracles of God. They've been hearing the gospel since they were a small child. It's no surprise that the majority of believers in the church are those who have been nurtured in that faith since they were small children. We shouldn't expect any less than that. God intends to work through the household. And as we gather on the Lord's Day in the household of God, we must realize that he's bringing together families into one greater family, which is the church family, that he's accomplished through his adoption, but is realized in a visible, tangible way as we gather and assemble together, that we are a family of families. Now, why say all of this? 
because we bring our individualistic assumptions and presuppositions into the household of God. And many of us do this without even realizing it. As we're considering church or even the worship service, we think, how will I get the most out of this experience? What's going to be the best for me? What's my learning style? And how am I going to be able to focus the most? What will this do for me? Is the question we often walk in with. But let me ask you, do you approach a Thanksgiving meal with that same sort of questioning? Do you walk in, what's going what's gonna to be the best for me as I gather with my aunts and my uncles and my nieces and my nephews and my great grandma and kids running around and a table full of food? Are you thinking, how am I going to be able to focus best and get the most out of this? No, right? Because part of the value is in the being together. It's the community that is important in that gathering, not just the self. Now, does the self matter? Of course it does. But as you gather, you're a part of something greater than yourself. And we get that in large family gatherings, but sometimes we miss that in the church and we think it's all about us and what we can get out of it. That is not the case. We are part of the household of God. It is a family of families. From the crying babies to the most senior saints, they all matter in this house. And as with any family, it's not all about you. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. You are still an individual with real personal needs. But what we must see is that God seeks to fulfill a lot of those real personal needs through a community of brothers and sisters and children and elderly saints all around you. You don't just need people exactly like you. You don't just need your particular peer group. We need the full household of God in order to be matured into the church that God would have us to be. The church is a family of families. The second point I want to make, and really the pinnacle of this sermon is lying in the second point, and that is the message is a word for all ages. The message is a word for all ages. I want to ask you, who is the church service for? When we gather on the Lord's day to worship him, who is it for? Is it for parents? Is it for singles? Is it for widows? Is it for the elderly? What about newlyweds? Is it for children? Is it for infants? Is it for teens? Is it for just a particular group that's just like us? And of course we would say to that, no. This gathering is for everyone. The songs we sing, the prayers we pray, the readings and sermons we listen to, the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, who are they for? They're for everyone. These are for the body gathered together. And thus, with that in mind, let's go back to our text in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Hopefully some of the foundation was laid there for that. And see what God's word has to say, beginning in verse 12. It says, assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner with your towns. Do you get the picture here? Everyone. No human in that community was excluded from that call. Everyone. Even the foreigner, even the sojourner, even the little children All of them gather everyone together within your towns that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law. The word of God was for everyone and the proclamation of it was to be heard by everyone with no discrimination. It was for all people in the community. And what is part of the purpose of this? Why was it so important that everyone was present? Why was it so important that everyone received God's law? Well, we're not left to speculate. Verse 13 tells us. It says, And that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. As long as you live in the land that you're going over to the Jordan to possess. So is this a temporary command? Not only did it involve everyone, but it was to impart to the children that they may know, and it was to be continued 
as long as they were to dwell in the land, which, guess what, wasn't supposed to be a temporary thing. Supposed to follow the Lord generation after generation after generation. Now, you might say, well, this is one isolated verse where multiple generations are present. You're making too much out of one isolated text. Well, I want to just go through, and this is not even all of them. I just simply cannot spend all the time this morning. But going over example after example through the Old Testament of how many times the call was given when the word of God was going to be read, that everyone be present for that reading and teaching. That it wasn't segregated or divided during that time. Listen to what it says in Joshua chapter 8, 34 and 35. So this is just a little bit farther in redemptive history as Joshua is leading the people. It says, and afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse according to all that was written in the book of the law. It says, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read. Who did he read this to? It says, before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. So we read all the word of God to all the assembled, which included everyone. In 2 Chronicles 20, 13, it says, Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. And so here we actually have two different categories of children present. It says the little ones and the children. So if you're wondering if this call is just for children of a certain age, well, he is delineating there the really little ones and the other children, okay? He says the little ones, their wives, and their children. Then going forward into the book of Ezra, it says, while Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, it says a very great assembly of who? Men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel for the people wept bitterly, not just for the hearing of God's word, but for their prayer and repentance. Everyone gathered together. They were necessary. They were part. Then going into Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 1 through 3, we just studied this recently. I'm going to only read some snippets of it, but it says, and all the people gathered as one man. Notice their unity, all of them gathering as one whole. Not in an individualistic way, but them being a community, the household, the family of God. It goes on to say, to clarify who that was, both men and women and all who could understand. All right? And then going forward into Joel chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. And who is to be a part of this solemn assembly? It says, Gather the people consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, notice elderly people, gather the children, and then it says even nursing infants. Do you get the picture? From the oldest to the youngest, everyone gathered together. Now, in saying all this, I know there's a person out there that's probably thinking, but Ryan, all of this was Old Testament. All of this was Old Testament. What does that have to say to us? Well, in the New Testament, it assumes that this is the practice. As the letters were being written to the New Testament church, it assumes that this is the principle for their assembly. And how do we know that? Well, an example of that would be in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, as the letter, the epistle to the Ephesians was sent to that local church, the assumption was by Paul that we'd be read in their gathering to instruct that church. And as Paul is writing to the assembly in Ephesians, to the local church there, he includes in his message that to be read to the congregation, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Notice he's quoting from the Old Testament. He's not afraid to do that. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now let me ask you, who's he talking to there? Who's he's assuming is going to be receiving that tension, that instruction within their assembly? It's the children. Because the word had a message for the children as well. It wasn't just a message for the grown-ups. There was instruction from God's word to the assembled children as well. And at this point in this service, I must tell you, children, if you're in here, this message is for you. 
Children, the word of God is for you. The worship of God is not a grown-up thing. It is a thing for all ages. And children, you must know that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. He rose from the grave that you might be saved from your sins. And just as Paul was teaching to obey your parents in the Lord, I'm sure, children, there's been times where you did not obey your parents in the Lord. I don't think any child in here has perfectly obeyed their parents in all times, in all seasons, never disobedient. But did you know that Jesus died for you? That even though you have disobeyed, Christ obeyed on your behalf. And through repentance and faith and trust in him, you can be saved from your your sins. This is not a call to the grown-ups. This is a call to all. Christ can save you. He delights in saving children. Do not neglect that. Children, God loves you. And as you come to church, children, there is a word for you. God wants to speak to you through his word. This is not grown-up time. It's a time for everyone. And for us adults, we must realize that this message is not just for us. This is not grown-up time where kids just need to be quiet so that we can focus better. This is not what happens in many of our homes at different times, right? If you need to have a serious conversation, maybe just as the parents, and so you put the kids down in the basement with a movie so that you can just talk one-on-one as a spouse, right? There's times for that. There's time for grown-up conversation. The gathered assembly is not one of them. Children are not a distraction or a nuisance to be put away where we can't see and hear them so that we can have grown-up time. That's not what the assembly of God's people and God's worship ought to be. This time is for them as well. Third point, the children, a blessing and example. The children, a blessing and example. Now, one of the things that I think every Christian I've ever met will verbalize and truly believes, even if maybe at times inconsistently, that children are a blessing, a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the room, a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He will not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate, is what Psalm 127 says. And we believe those verses. And many of us will make artwork of little arrows with our children's name on them and put them up in the household, right? And we love that. We believe that they are a blessing. But going back to my opening question, should we receive the blessing into our gathered worship or should we remove it from our gathered worship? And sometimes we don't treat children like the blessing they really are because we view them as a distraction. They're a disruption to our individualistic attempt to focus better or to be more attentive on what is being spoken and thus we'd rather them be removed We'd rather that they simply be out of sight and out of mind for a little while. Now, let me ask you, do you think this has ever happened before over the course of human history? Well, it has happened. It's happened over and over again. And do you know what? It happened when Jesus was teaching. The children were brought to him and the disciples, they said, man, this is distracting. Put away those kids. Don't you know he's doing serious business right now? And not only did this happen in Jesus' life, but of our four Gospels that we have, three of them felt the necessity of including this encounter. It was not a message that God's people should miss in the intimate worship. It's reiterated three times. I'm going to read each of them because I want the consistency of this to stick in for us. As children were brought to Jesus, as he was teaching How did the disciples respond and how did Jesus respond? All right? I want you to be thinking of that as I read these. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 through 15. It says, Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. 
in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. It says, now when they were bringing, listen to what Luke includes, even infants to him. Do you know infants cry and fuss, make a lot of noise? Sometimes it's hard to hear over them. They're bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Finally, in Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 13 through 16, it says, And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying hands on them. So we see in this encounter, in the three different examples of it, that the disciples' response to the children coming to Jesus to receive prayer, to receive healing, their response was that of turning them away. Because they were a distraction. They were an annoyance. Who knows what was going on in their hearts, but I can almost hear the excuses they were making. And what was Jesus' response to his disciples? Well, the two words stick out in those three different passages. The first was rebuke, and the second was he was indignant. Not only did he rebuke them, but he had righteous anger against his disciples for turning away these children. Don't you know this message is for them too? Five applications I want us to see from children being a blessing and an example. The first is that children should not be hindered from coming to Christ. Children should not be hindered from coming to Christ. They should be welcomed in. And you know, there's different methodologies and different practices in different churches, but one thing that has become increasingly popular, particularly in a lot of larger churches, is they actually will not allow children into the sanctuary. Now say what you want about different methodologies and different practices, but if a church says your children are not welcome in the service, that is a really big red flag. Children should not be hindered from coming to God. It brings about the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke and indignation. Second application, grown-up disciples deserve a rebuke when they do so. They deserve a rebuke when they do so. I will just tell you as the pastor, if you come to me complaining because it's hard to focus because some kid is squirming, I'd say, you need to learn from that child. You need to help that parent. This is a family of families. It's not all about you. It's not all about you. Jesus rebuked them for turning these children away. The third thing I want us to see is that the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. The offer of the gospel goes to all people of all ages. And that certainly includes the children Fourth point I want us to see, we must learn from the children how we are to respond to the gospel in faith. Notice that this is not just some generic call that children are important and you shouldn't turn them away, but they are actually an example held up by Jesus as well. I think most of us can see this quite plainly if you've been around any young disciple of the Lord, that their faith is admirable. They have a trust and a hope and a confidence in the promises of God that grown-ups tend to lose. And thus, if we need to exercise the faith that God calls us to exercise as his disciples, we would do well to spend a lot of time with children who are disciples of his. You see, children, I want you to hear that this message is not only for you, but you actually contribute to our gathering. We would not be whole without you. We would be lacking a picture of faith without you. Children are an example that we are to follow when it comes to their faith and trust in Jesus. 
And if we remove them, we remove a component of what our faith ought to look like. We need the children to learn from their faith as well. The fifth point, I want to ask, can we be faithful Christians without children in our life, in our midst? I don't believe we can. Because what Jesus is saying, in no uncertain terms, is that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So we must ask the question, how do children receive it? And thus, if we remove children from our faith in life, how are we going to answer that question, which is of primary importance? He says it's necessary to enter his kingdom. We must not turn them away. Children are a blessing. We want more blessings from God, not less. But they're also an example to us. The fourth point, and I wish I could spend much, much longer on this fourth point than I can, but hopefully, Lord willing, it'll be helpful in the time we have, and that is parents, tour guides of joy. Parents are tour guides of joy. Now, I shamelessly stole that line from a book by Scott Brown that's really helpful called The Family at Church, subtitle, Tour Guides of Joy. And it, it's a really great book. Um, my wife and I are reading it right now. But it's a beautiful picture of what the parents are to do for their children. They are to be tour guides of joy. They are to show them the joy that comes from following the Lord in obedience to his law and his commands. They are to walk them along in these things. And this comes from the beautiful passage that many of you know from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. But they don't stay on your heart. They then govern your actions. It says you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The picture here is that as you're leading children through life, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep, you're shepherding them into the truths of the love of God and his word. You are guiding them in this. You're, you're guiding them to the joy that they can have in Christ Jesus. This command is given to us that we should not neglect that Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That as parents, we have an incredible task in front of us to help guide our children to what the gospel teaches them. And thus, again, we must view the church as a family of families that part of our job is not to just receive when we come to church, but part of our job as parents is to help impart to our children as we come to church, that we are receiving these things, but also we're doing our best to help them to receive these things as well. Again, they're not a nuisance to be rid of. They're a joyful duty for us to engage in as we shepherd them in these truths. Parents, it is our joyful duty to shepherd our children in the new covenant promises. And I just want to encourage you, there is nothing more important that you can do with your time now, this is not limited to our local church gathering. This is a job from when you rise up to when you lie down. This is a job that you pour the best of your energy and efforts into to shape them and mold them and show them how to delight in God and his word and his promises. This is not something that you can simply do for an hour a week. This is not something that you can delegate to someone else to do. This is something that God has given you to do, to impart to your children a love for him and his gospel. And it's not always easy. In fact, it's incredibly difficult. But what good is, thing is easy? Everything worth having in this life, everything worth pursuing comes with challenge. And so as we're going through this teaching, I want to be very clear, I am not exhorting the easy thing. I am exhorting the good thing, the glorious thing, the thing that points the offspring that the Lord has given you to their creator and maker and savior. 
few words of encouragement as we close. The first is the fathers need to lead and bounce. Fathers need to lead and bounce. And what I mean by lead is that fathers are given a particular role in leading in this task. And often, I think because a, a woman is naturally, right, maternal in caring for the children, husbands, we can think that this task just gets completely delegated to our spouses. But husbands, we have a responsibility to lead in these matters. And thus, I encourage you, when you come to the household of God, don't just give your wife a glance every time your kids are squirming. You need to be the one to help. It's not a bad thing if in our services, fathers are standing at the sides bouncing children. It's not a bad thing if fathers can actually take their toddler and walk out with them because they need to be addressed in a discipline issue. Women, this doesn't only fall on you. Husbands need to help in these matters, and fathers need to take a leadership role in these things and do it for the joy set before you. Many of us, because of our vocational efforts, don't get as much time with our children. We should take the time that we have, particularly the time on the Lord's Day that we're giving to Him in worship. Fathers need to lead and to bounce. You're never going to get in trouble in this church for standing up to bounce a baby, all right? It's a glorious thing. The second point is linked to this, that members need to serve one another, that we are a family of families. And thus, the task of caring for children, particularly a lot of small children, is not always easy. But this is where the body of Christ comes around each other to serve one another. And this could be maybe you're in your older years, and you're, or maybe you're single, and you just choose to sit next to a family that's got some squirming kids in order to be an aid to them. Maybe that means when the kid that's squirming in the row in front of you looks at you, you smile at them instead of giving them a dirty look, which happens, all right? It happens. You encourage the moms and the dads who are seeking to be faithful in these things. Often they feel overwhelmed, or if their kids are squirming, they think all eyes are on them. And if you just go up and out, you're doing such a good job. Keep it up. It's a blessing to the whole church, and it's a blessing to your family. Keep doing the good work. God has you to encourage one another in this task and to help one another in this task, particularly in our local church, where at any given time we have tons of husbands who are deployed. Help those women out. Come around them. It's not all about you. You're a part of something bigger than yourself when you gather on the Lord's day. We are a family of families. Members need to serve one another. The third point I want to make is that distractions happen in healthy households. Distractions happen in healthy households. The strength of our health as a local church is not that there's never any distractions, okay? If you've ever been over to a healthy household and enjoyed dinner with them, you'll notice there's distractions. There's kids running around. There's a, a something that gets spilled. There's a diaper that needs to get changed. Someone gets hit in the head with a block, okay? These things happen, all right? And these things are normal. Again, we shouldn't be so consumed with soaking up and atten being attentive for every point of every sermon. The reality is that most of you could not say what my sermon title was three weeks ago. And that's okay. God pours into you for times and for seasons. He gives you the word that you need for that moment. And sometimes the attention that you will get in a service is like five minutes of uninterrupted squirming. Well, praise the Lord. You heard an exhortation for five minutes. Take it, utilize it, and go about your work. This idea that us being so academically focused for every moment is not the standard of health in a local church. Now, by all means, discipline your children, right? If they're running around screaming, don't be like, well, Pastor Ryan said it's okay, you know? That's not the point, all right? That's not the point. But also, they learn through being disciplined, which means that they cross the line at times. They need correction at times. They're going to be a distraction at times. That's how they learn. And to expect them to just be perfect, little, silent, you know, nothings the whole time is not an expectation we can have as a congregation. Distractions happen in healthy households. The fourth point I want to give is from 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11, and that is that discipline yields fruit in season. Discipline yields fruit in season. So I'm going to close this sermon by reading this text from Hebrews 12. If you want to flip over there, you can. I'll read verses 3 through 11. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are an illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray on behalf of the families of this church that you would allow them to be disciplined according to your righteous word. And Lord, I pray, knowing the challenge it is of having young toddlers and squirming children and feeling overwhelmed and wondering what benefit is this. And Lord, I pray that as a people, that we would not be governed by our emotional status in the moment. Because Lord, we know as parents, there's times where we feel overwhelmed, we feel distracted, we feel anxiety. But Lord, in those times, would we be governed by the truth of your word? Would we know that the children of this church are a blessing from you? Would we see that it is our task to receive with faith the kingdom of heaven like they do? Lord, would we know that our efforts are not in vain and that even if a season seems long and we don't see the fruit right away, that we can trust in your promises that it will yield a peaceful fruit of righteousness if we are disciplined enough to be trained by it. Lord, I pray for the children of this church. And Lord, I pray that every child in here, in this room, would be with us in glory. Lord, we ask and plead that we would have undivided families before your throne in heaven. And Lord, I pray for those who have grown children that are wandering. Lord, we ask that you would bring those children home, that you would restore to them the years that the locust has eaten. God, would you sanctify our families? Would you use us to pour into our children, whether they're young or grown? And God, I pray for us as a church that we would not be so individualistic, that we would not be consumeristic in our gathering, but that we would truly engage as a family before your word, that we would bear one another's burdens, that we would love one another, that we would bless one another, that we would delight in one another, and that we would learn from one another. Lord, would you help us do these things? And we know that we can only do them not out of our own strength, but because you've made us your children. And we can come before you crying, Abba, Father. Lord, we thank you. Would you help us to do these things? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.